The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Burke, along here with Andy Capehart, and we are with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, APS TARC, and we would like to welcome you to this webinar, Scams and Fraud, Building Your Toolkit of Resources. I will introduce our speakers here in just a moment. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I would like to share a little bit of information. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and is administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors and speakers' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide, please. This webinar is being brought to you by a collaboration among all the Administration for Community Living's Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services Resource Centers. You can see them listed here on this slide, and we invite you to visit the websites of each center to learn more about the work that they do. Next slide, please. Now on to some housekeeping. Handouts and slides are available in the handout section of your webinar control panel. You may download them at any time. Please use your computer speakers to access audio for this webinar. Please make sure the speaker volume is adjusted to your desired volume. If you happen to experience audio or connection problems during this presentation, we recommend that you sign out of the webinar and re-enter. That typically fixes most issues. Next slide, please. We are planning to have time at the end of, the, of this webinar for questions and comments, but you may ask questions of our presenters at any time by, by typing them into the questions box into your webinar control panel. We will relay as many as we can to the speakers when we pause for questions at the end of the presentation. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the TARC website at a later date along with a copy of the slides. We will notify all registrants via email when it is posted online. Everyone attending today will receive an email approximately 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. And please be sure to take the brief eval survey when prompted. We always love to hear your feedback. Next slide, please. So before we get started, let's get a sense of who's joining us today through a quick attendee poll. Which of the following do you most identify with? Social service professional, legal assistant professional, medical professional, justice professional, or other? And please note this is a single choice answer. So we'll give you a few seconds here. So again, single choice answer. Okay, I see responses coming in. We'll give it a few more seconds here. Give everybody an opportunity to vote. Andy, let's go ahead and close that poll. Let's see here, we have 83% social service professional, 2% legal assistance, we have 1% medical professional, 5% justice professional, and 9% other. Thank you all so much for taking that poll. Next slide, please. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. We have two. We have Erin Key. She is an aging program specialist from the office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services, Administration on Aging, Administration for Community Living, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We also have Jacqueline blasse fried Assistant Director of the Consumer Protection Branch, United States Department of Justice. So Erin, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you first. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you all for joining the 2023 Administration for Community Living and Department of Justice's Fraud and Scams webinar series. And thank you to APS TARC for hosting this webinar series. As Jessica mentioned, I am Erin Key, an Aging Program Specialist at ACL. <clears throat> Today is the last webinar in this four-part series. Throughout the year, we've taken a comprehensive look at the lifespan of scams and frauds 
with the framework that the best response is a holistic person-centered practice from all professionals and advocates involved in addressing these types of situations. Our goal with this webinar series has been to provide actionable learnings that empower all of us to collaborate and partner so that we can better fight these frauds and scams. In the first webinar in the series, The Fraud Pitch, we discussed how mental frameworks impact an individual's susceptibility to fraud, as well as recent research on fraud pitches and insights into why they work. In the second webinar, Reporting and Recovering Funds, we talked about how to report scams and frauds and recover funds for victims. And in the third webinar, we had a panel conversation with experts about how to identify the emotional toll taken by fraud, the range of emotions experienced by victims, and how that might impact how we respond and assist these individuals. Today, during the webinar, we're going to give a brief recap of each session and then share some resources that we think will help based on the topic. But if you're interested in watching the full webinars, you can check them out on the APS TARC's YouTube channel by going to youtube.com backslash at APS TARC backslash videos. Next slide. During the first webinar in the series, we focused on why fraud pitches work. Next slide. To start, we looked at tactics and communication styles, such as threats of financial loss or punishment, promises of a reward, such as a job, romance, etc., using urgency and authority, and demands for privacy and confidentiality. These types of tactics often work because they invoke an emotional response, whether positive or negative, that an individual feels they must respond to. We also discussed how four mental frameworks guide our choices. Research has shown that the four mental frameworks discussed during the webinar appeared to play a strong role in the way interviewees perceived fraud attempts and whether they lost money to scams. We wrapped up that webinar by hearing about the FAST program in Marin County. The FAST program consists of both private and public sector employees who provide training and cons consultation on recognizing, investigating, and preventing elder abuse. This presentation focused on how to create a FAST program in your own community. So if that's something you might be interested in, I recommend checking out that webinar. Today, I'm gonna start off by discussing other resources that are available to help prevent fraud pitches from working. Next slide. I've broken down these resources into programs that are designed to be facilitated or presented by a community-based organization that I'll share first. Then I'm gonna share some resources that are designed to, used by, to be used by older adults and the caregivers themselves on their own time. First, from the CFPB, there is an Elder Fraud Prevention Network Development Guide. The goal of this guide is to help communities develop a network that can mobilize key stakeholders in their community to prevent, detect, and respond to elder abuse. The guide includes a meeting model that has two key meetings that it focuses on. First, an initial convening, and then a post-convening. Convening. And these resources are designed to help communities bring stakeholders together to enhance the prevention of and the response to elder financial exploitation. In the toolkit, there are tools that you can also use to create and grow your network as you expand your elder fraud prevention network. There are tools for helping you plan meetings, identifying and prioritizing your community's goals, and also tools to build foundational knowledge on elder fraud prevention. Also from the CFPB is a program called Money Smart for Older Adults. And this is an instructor-led training that provides awareness among older adults and their caregivers on how to prevent financial exploitation and to encourage advanced planning and informed financial decision making. This is a three-part module that has an instructor guide, a resource guide for participants to use after they've finished the course, and a PowerPoint presentation. The materials for participants, um, including the resource guide and the PowerPoint presentation, are available in both English and Spanish. And the instructor guide is available in English. Next slide, please. 
The Pass It On program is a program that was developed by the FTC to share information about scams and frauds within communities. On this program's website, there's a page where you can download resources such as articles, activity sheets, bookmarks, and PowerPoint presentations that can be used to educate older adults about various types of scams and frauds. The materials on the website are divided by topic. So if there's a topic within your community that you know has become rampant, such as home repair scams or health insurance scams or investment scams, you can search by for available resources based on the topic that they have been um, bookmarked as. There's also some great resources within this program on how to protect an individual's identity. Another thing I wanted to highlight about this program is that they have a video about how the program is being used in communities. So if you're looking for ideas on how you could use this type of resource in your own community, that's a great video to watch. The Center on Elder Abuse has also developed a series of PSAs about elder fraud prevention. You can view their PSAs on their YouTube channel and they can be used at community events and shown in public to provide information and awareness about different types of frauds and scams. And here, each PSA also focuses on a specific topic. So you can tailor the PSAs available to your needs. Next slide, please. The FTC has also developed a series of videos that are designed for communities to use to educate older adults about different types of scams. And today, I thought it would be helpful to share one of these videos. So we're going to quickly share the video, How to Avoid a Tech Scam, as a demonstration of a video. My name is Don Holmes. I live in Sun City West, Arizona. In this community, we're all seniors. After you move in here, even if you don't know anybody, you get to know other people you enjoy doing things with. I use a computer predominantly for email and to get the news. One day a thing pops up and kind of blocks the screen and says, you've got all kinds of uh, viruses in your computer. The design of the pop-up uh, had a Microsoft logo on the top and they had a number and I couldn't get rid of this, this thing on the screen. Turn the computer off, turn it back on, still there. So I called the number. They identified themselves as Microsoft. I had no feeling that there was any, anything wrong. Tech support scams are real and they're causing enormous consumer injury. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and that's just based on the FTC's own law enforcement work. Just like Mr. Holmes, a lot of people are getting pop-ups on their screens and often they, they claim to be uh, associated with a company such as Microsoft or Apple, giving them lots of credibility. They told me they would clear what they considered to be malware in there. In order to clear it up, they needed to get into my computer and have my control of the computer turned over to them. So I gave them my password. They went in, the thing came off of the screen. When I went back to my computer the next day, I couldn't access my files. You'd never let a stranger into your house. Don't let one into your computer. If you get a pop-up, don't click on a link. If you get a phone call from someone who says your computer's security is at risk, don't listen to them. Stop, take the time to talk to a friend, talk to a family member. When this happened to me, I was a little bit embarrassed. I mean, I consider myself fairly alert, but I was targeted and I was scammed. I didn't really want to talk about this, but I realized that if I didn't talk about it, that if I didn't file the complaint with the Attorney General, that if I didn't file a complaint with the FTC, that, that I would have shrunk into myself. And by talking about it, by talking to all my friends, they're not amateurs, Don. I began to realize that they also started talking, and they started indicating that they had experienced similar things. That kind of community, that kind of exposure, it's not an embarrassment, it's just something that happens when you're a senior. You have to talk about to other seniors. What I would suggest is contact the FTC. They have a website. You can fill out a complaint online. We can be empowered with your family, your friends, and other people within your community to try to put a stop or at least protect ourselves from these kinds of scams.
great. So that is a great video, I think, that can be used in conjunction with some of the other resources that we've already talked about around providing education to older adults about what scams and frauds might look like, how they might experience it, and then some of the other topics we've talked about, such as reporting and some of the emotional recovery and being open and talking to your peers about what you've experienced. Next slide, please. There are also a lot of resources that are available for older adults to plan ahead and learn the signs of scams and frauds so that they can recognize when something is not right. First, I wanted to share the Thinking Ahead Roadmap. This is an advanced financial care planning tool for primarily the prevention of elder fraud and exploitation. The roadmap is designed to be used by anyone interested in planning ahead, no matter how much money they have, their family situation, or how old they are. This roadmap includes tools for how to organize your financial information, what thoughts you might consider when deciding whether or not you want to have a financial advocate. If you do decide to have a financial advocate, how to have conversations with that financial advocate, and then how to plan to shift the money management over time if that is needed in your situation. So that is a, a really great resource that's designed to be used over time and really um, allow someone to think about what kind of decisions they want to make at any point in their life for planning for their financial future. Next, I wanted to highlight managing someone else's money. And this is a series of tools developed by the CFPB that can be used to help someone understand the types of financial caregiving options that are available and to also help them decide which one they might want to use depending on their situation. There's a worksheet that helps you kind of think through the different options and it focuses on four different fiduciary roles. If someone is acting in one of their, those types of fiduciary roles, there are also guides that are tailored to the needs of the people in the fiduciary roles. So for example, a guide for someone who is serving as a power of an attorney or a guide for someone who is serving as a court appointed guardian. The CFPB also has a set of resources to help someone plan for diminished capacity. And the focus of these tools is to plan ahead for your financial future in order to prevent fraud and financial abuse by deciding how you want your finances to be managed throughout your lifespan. These tools allow an individual to stay in control of their own finances. And finally, if an older adult is interested in staying up to date on what the latest scams and frauds are that are out there so that they can know to be alert and maybe recognize when something they're seeing is not right. For example, the gentleman in the video who saw the pop-up, um, they could listen to the AARP podcast, The Perfect Scam. Each episode of this podcast focuses on the story of a specific individual who is the target of a scam, and then it talks about what tactics were used in that scam so that listeners can understand what was happening and have some things to be on the lookout for. AARP also provides fraud watch alerts. And these are text alerts that users can sign up for where they'll be alerted to the latest scams. So um, I think we all know that oftentimes one type of scam becomes popular and can become very frequent and prevalent for a while. And so this is a way to stay up to date on what's going on. Uh, next slide, please. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Jackie. All right. Thanks so much, Erin. I am super excited to be with you all today, this this afternoon and recap what I think has been a really, I hope, helpful for you all um, series on scams and webinars. And I have gotten a lot out of your comments and questions back to us as well. It has been an incredible experience to be a part 
of the APS and the TART community to be with you all for these last three sessions. And I am sad to see the series ending, but happy to have an opportunity to talk with you all about some resources surrounding our second and third sessions. So these are some resources that you can use first when you deal with helping people to report some sort of scam and fraud attempt, and then also when you're helping people to recover funds from a scam and fraud attempt. Next slide, please. All right, so very briefly, let's just do a quick recap of what we heard in session two. Um, in session two, we had some really incredible speakers who talked to us about what can impact when a particular individual is able to recover money from a scam attempt, and then some really important information about how to report frauds and scams, where to report frauds and scams, and the kinds of information that you would need to report. So just quickly, let's go through some of the highlights. First, financial recovery is likely going to be dependent on many factors. Some of these are going to be um, experiences that we can help people deal with and maybe get them to the reporting or get them to the recovery phase. Others are going to be more challenging from a social service perspective to get someone to engage with law enforcement or engage in the reporting process. Some of these things are going to be the amount and the method of transaction. As a practical matter, as we heard from some of the speakers, some money moves faster than others. The faster money moves, the less likely it is that we are going to be able to recover that money for a particular individual. That doesn't mean it's not worth trying, that doesn't mean there's not any tools and resources, but the faster money moves, the more difficult it is to recover. And this kind of makes sense. And we'll talk a little bit about how that's going to impact some of our resources and tools in just a minute. One of the biggest factors on whether or not someone is able to recover money is whether or not they are willing to report it. As a practical matter, unless they are willing to have a conversation with someone, it's going to be difficult to try and recover that money. So getting the folks that we are working with, getting the community at large interested and willing to talk to the government, to talk with you all, to where they are comfortable getting over that embarrassment if that's what they're going through, to actually report the fraud is very, very critical. So as Aaron talked about a little bit, the more we can talk about scams and frauds as being something that happens and something that's out there. And as you heard from the FTC video, the more we can share those experiences and including others to do the same, hopefully we can get over this unwillingness of victims to sometimes report. Another factor is going to be who stole the money. And there's going to be a couple of difficulties here. If it is a foreign fraudster who is involved in the scam and that money has already gone overseas, it's going to be very, very difficult to recover. But interestingly, on the other end of the spectrum can also be very difficult. And that's if a family or a caregiver has stolen that money. You know, you're often going to have an older adult who's going to be less willing to take that money back. And there might be fewer remedies or tools in order to get that money back. Reporting, however, is so, so critical. And you heard from Rachel Yurkovich at IC3 about all of the really wonderful information that happens behind the scenes when someone does report to law enforcement, when someone does file that FTC complaint or that IC3 complaint. If you have someone who's interested and willing to report, there's some steps that you can take that will help that make that report as successful as possible. The first is to help people gather information prior to reporting. You know, if it's something that's just a, a you know, a one-off letter that they responded to, there might not be a lot of paperwork, but having a copy of the check they sent, having a copy of the letter that they responded to, ready and able to submit to law enforcement or to someone who is willing to help try to recover the funds is going to make that person's job just a little bit easier. If it's a more involved scam, you know, maybe something here like a romance fraud where you have someone who's been communicating via text message or online for multiple years, they're going to have text messages, they're going to have emails, they're going to have wire records, they're going to have bank statements. The more that information can be collected ahead of time and be at someone's fingertips, the easier it's going to be to get that report filed. One thing that's really helpful um, for me, selfishly, in law enforcement is when you all manage someone's expectations about the reporting process. We receive thousands and thousands and thousands of complaints every day from scam victims all across the country. We simply do not have the resources to open a case on every single victim. However, no case happens without victims coming forward. So it could be that someone files a complaint on FTC, files a complaint on IC3, they don't hear back immediately. That actually doesn't mean they're not gonna hear back a year from now when I am pulling additional threads and looking for additional victims. 
And frankly, even if a particular individual never hears from law enforcement, it's really, really important for them to know that that doesn't mean nothing happens with that complaint. We do a huge amount of work on complaints that would be simply impossible if consumers were not telling us their experiences. And that includes things like the FTC frauds alert. You know, the, will, the reason that they were able to send out those updated fraud alerts um, on a regular basis, the scam spotlights that they do is because victims tell them on a daily basis what they're experiencing. So really, really important. So manage those expectations and relay the importance of the reporting to hopefully help people through the process. Next slide, please. All right, so there's a couple of places to start when you're helping someone potentially recover funds from some sort of scam or fraud attempt. And, you know, uh, Andy or Jessica said at the very beginning, but I just want to note one more time that you'll see lots and lots of hyperlinks throughout the deck today. All of those are, in fact, hyperlinks. So if you do pull out the handouts from today's webinar, you'll be able to click on those and hopefully they will take you to the places you need to be to pull these resources directly. The first is that the FINRA Foundation and the National Center for Victims of Crime have a couple of checklists that are really pretty helpful in thinking through the many steps that a potential victim should go through if they think they have fallen victim to some sort of scam or fraud attempt. There are those that are unique to investment fraud, um, victims of financial fraud, and victims of mass marketing fraud, which is a sort of a fancy way of saying some sort of telephone, email, or mail scam. These checklists are gonna go through the reporting process, they're going to go through some of the recovery steps that someone could take, like contacting their bank, contacting whatever method it was that they sent the payment, and then also talking about the kind of information that can be gathered, as well as preventing identity theft and potentially dealing with trying to bring a civil action if that's something that's available under um, the particular kinds of frauds or scam that it was. So really great checklist, something that you could take a look at print off, hand to someone, or something that you could just keep on your desk when you're trying to think through how to potentially help someone recover from a scam attempt. Very similarly, the Federal Trade Commission has a great website that goes through some of the basic steps that a potential scam victim should take. Where to report, who to tell to try to get the money back, and then again, some of those identity theft prevention steps. So these are sort of ideas about like a one-stop shop. If you need to think about the steps that a fraud victim should potentially go through, these are really great checklists to again, stick on the side of your desk. So when you're talking to someone who has had this experience, you're thinking through the, the many steps that someone could potentially um, undertake in order to not only deal with this fraud or scam attempt, but also prevent the next fraud or scam attempt. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about monetary recovery, it's important to remember that speed is of the essence. As I talked about a little bit at the beginning, when money travels fast, it is more and more difficult to get it back. So that is always going to be the most important step in monetary recovery is doing it quickly. So one of the questions that I get most frequently in my job where I'm talking to scam victims and AUSAs all across the country who are talking to scam victims is who do I tell? And how do I find out if I have sent money to someone to try to get it back? So the Federal Trade Commission actually has a pretty easy chart that talks about the different ways that people send money and has some contact information about that, about those different ways. So for example, if someone sent money via gift cards, please report that to law enforcement, but the first call should actually be to the company through which the gift card was purchased. So if it's a Target gift card, call Target. If it's an Apple gift card, call Apple. There is a window of opportunity for those retailers to try and seize those funds that are sitting on that gift card. Similarly, if it goes via a wire transfer, then calling the bank to make sure that the bank, if that money is still in transit, puts a stop on that money. And the FTC chart has those links, has the different kinds of monetary payments that we see in all these frauds and scams and the different financial institutions that should potentially be contacted depending on the way in which the money was sent. And that's what's gonna be critical for the most part for monetary recovery. You wanna tell the entity through which the money was sent. That typically is gonna be the first call. Particularly, however, with large recent payments, it's really helpful to couple that first call to the financial entities with reporting to law enforcement. If you go back and listen to the webinar, Rachel Yurkovich from IC3 talked about something called the RAT, 
the rapid or the recovery asset team. What the RAT is, is it is a system where if something goes via wire or at times via cryptocurrency and that money is still in transit, FBI works with financial institutions all across the country to get that money stopped. So they have basically a hotline where they can talk directly to a financial institution and try to get a wire recalled or to try to get that money stopped as it travels through the financial system. So that means if you have someone who sent, you know, let's say $40,000 because they thought they were paying Microsoft to make sure that their money was safe or they think they are paying the FBI because otherwise they're going to be under arrest and that went through a wire transfer then calling the financial institution through which the wire was sent and as quickly thereafter filing a report with IC3 so you can get it in that rapid asset team's hands and try to get that money stopped and recovered. So particularly again, when you're dealing with large recent payments, couple those two phone calls, those two complaints as close in time as possible because they're really gonna work together to if that money is not already gone, hopefully stop that money in transit. Next slide, please. So some other recovery steps aside from monetary recovery to definitely keep in the back of your mind, and these are going to be on that recovery checklist. The first is to guard against identity theft. Anytime that anyone has given any sort of personal information to a fraudster, whether it's over the phone, in a text message, on a website they didn't realize was a spoofed website, make sure that that individual is going to identitytheft.gov and creating an identity theft prevention plan. This is a really phenomenal website that will walk someone through the different steps that need to be taken in order to prevent identity theft. Things like putting fraud alerts on credit reports, but it goes way beyond that. You know, banks that need to be told, other entities that should be told. So it sort of is, a, it builds a toolkit for a particular individual based on a particular set of circumstances that they provide to the system. So again, this is a really great website when you're talking about preventing identity theft. And really, anytime anyone has given any sort of information to a fraudster, thinking about identity theft is definitely going to be a good next step. Something else to think about is to guard against re-victimization. So there's a couple of things that people can do here in terms of recoveries to prevent those additional phone calls one or those additional text messages. One thing that is not discussed as frequently as frankly we all need to be talking about it is that once someone has given money to a fraudster, that person's information is going to go on a list. A list of individuals who unfortunately have fallen for some sort of fraud or scam. That list will then get reused by that fraudster or be sold to other fraudsters. So a really great step to hopefully calm the fears of victims and hopefully deal with any sort of re-victimization is to limit the fraudster's ability to contact that individual. So the FCC has a guide on how to block texts and various different phone carriers have different ways that you can block text messages that the FCC guide can be helpful with. So if it came via a phone call, or frankly, if just limiting phone calls is a good idea, I frankly have some of these steps in place to limit the number of scam calls that I get. This FCC guide is a really good place to start to figure out how to limit the number of those calls and text messages that someone might get. Additionally, this is not a silver bullet, I've got to be fully honest, but it's good to make sure that someone is on the do not call list that both their cell phones and their home phone numbers are on the do not call list, which is operated by the Federal Trade Commission. Unsurprisingly, uh, fraudsters do not adhere to the do not call list. They do not pull it to make sure they're calling people on the do not call list, but it will reduce the number of junk phone calls that people get, which can be helpful in making someone just feel better about their daily lives because they're not you know, afraid when their phone is ringing. If it happens to be a family, a caregiver, a friend kind of fraud, you know, take steps to limit that contact um, as much as you can to ensure that the opportunity does not arise for the scam or fraud to occur again. Next slide, please. So we already talked a little bit about this, but here are the hyperlinks, which I wanted to make sure that you all had. So when I talked earlier about the rapid asset team or the recovery asset team, we just call it the rat most of the time, um, that is part of the kill chain. The kill chain is just a 
really weird law enforcement -y term for basically putting a stop to money that's going through the financial system. It applies primarily to wires and to crypto. It typically is going to be fairly significant amounts. We're talking usually five figures, and it does have to be a relatively recent transfer. A good rule of thumb is within the last 72 hours. Outside of that, there's a good chance that the money is no longer in transit. You want to report that information to the kill chain to this rat as it's called via ic3 of course the link is right there the ic3 portal asks for a lot of information it's because they need a lot of information for this process to work but if that is going to be um, intimidating for someone to help to have that information pulled in there is something called the National Elder Fraud Hotline. That elder fraud hotline can help someone make that IC3 report. So walk someone through, you know, finding the right number that's on their wire receipt or finding the routing number that's on the check that they sent. So that elder fraud hotline, if you don't have time to sit with someone and make the IC3 complaint, these folks can help get that done. One final note before we move on to reporting to law enforcement and how that can in particular help with monetary recovery, we still see a fair number of scams that are good old fashioned fraudsters asking for people to pull money out of their bank account, put it in a box and put it in the mail. So the Postal Service and the Postal Inspection Service have the ability to do a package intercept. So if that parcel, if that package is still in the mail, you can go to this online form, put in the information, and try to get that package stopped before it's delivered. So much like IC3, this is going to have to be something that's happened relatively recently, and it's important or helpful if someone's going to have the track number but don't forget when you're talking about scams that are involving cash in a box things like lottery fraud is a very typical one there is this package intercept opportunity next slide please so on reporting one final note it's really important to sort of avoid reporting paralysis there are a huge number of places that someone could potentially report a fraud or a scam attempt i'm going to highlight three and one of the reasons I'm really only going to highlight three is it is a, um, a poorly kept secret that on the back end of many, many reporting hotlines, these hotlines talk to one another. So for example, if someone files a complaint with their state attorney general, there is a really very good chance that that a complaint to that attorney general also ends up in the Federal Trade Commission's Consumer Sentinel Network database. If someone files with Medicare, that they got a call asking for their Medicare number. That information, I think, ends up in the FTC's Consumer Sentinel database. So a lot of these systems talk to one another. So don't be hung up on where is the best place to report. Hope that we in the background are doing what we need to communicate because we work very hard on that in law enforcement to make sure we're exchanging information and just get it reported. So avoid that reporting paralysis, get it reported. So a couple of just things to highlight. We already talked about the National Elder Fraud Hotline. One nice thing about this hotline is these folks are trained on where to send different reports so they can help someone walk through where a particular scam or fraud might be reported. The FTC is always a good place to report a scam. They, they literally have, I think, 5,000 different law enforcement agencies who are involved in their reporting. So a huge number of people who are looking at the FTC's data, who are giving data to the Federal Trade Commission. So always a good place to report a scam attempt. And finally, the Internet Crime Complaint Center, which we've already discussed. Next slide, please. So a couple of just other comments. Um, so if you have an identifiable business in a particular state, one reporting opportunity that is often overlooked is a state attorney general. It's pretty common for most state attorney generals to have really active consumer protection units. So if it is something like a local business who has promised to pave someone's driveway, that individual has given them ten dollars or $15,000 and then that contractor never showed back up, there are a lot of state attorney generals out there who will send a letter to that business and request a response. Often that can mean that the person gets their money back because no one likes to get a letter from a state attorney general wondering what's happening. So this is a really good place that again is often overlooked. So if you do have that identifiable business in a particular state, don't forget about state attorney generals. They really do some phenomenal work and they will often send letters to businesses saying, hey, on behalf of this consumer, what happened here? And it's not unusual at all for them to get refunds and that sort of thing for consumers. 
One last note, if it's a financial product or service, the CFPB is a great place to report some sort of fraud or scam attempt. Uh, similar to state attorney generals, one nice thing about the CFPB is when they get a complaint about a particular business or corporation, they will send that business or corporation, if permitted, um, a letter that says, we got this letter from this consumer that's complaining about this particular item. And then businesses are actually required if they're regulated by the CFPB to respond. So again, sometimes this can result in a business getting a little bit fearful of getting such a letter from a federal agency and taking action. Next slide. Final thought here, beware the follow on fraud and make sure that when you're talking with people about frauds and scams, you're talking with them about the fraud that's coming next. We talked a little bit already about lead lists. So if it's someone who, for instance, has fallen prey to a government imposter scam, they think they paid the FBI, it's very possible that the next call will be from a, quote, private attorney who is going to help them recover those funds. You know, we, we see it pretty common right now in cryptocurrency, where if someone has lost money to a cryptocurrency scam, the next phone call is going to be from a company that specializes in helping people recover from cryptocurrency scams. So again, I don't have a resource for you here, um, just sort of a selfish word of warning for folks who are talking with scam victims. You know, be aware and talk with them about the follow on fraud because we're seeing a huge percentage of losses right now, not to the initial scam, but to the second scam. Next slide, please. All right, so session three, we talked about emotional impact and recovery. Next slide, please. So we had three speakers that covered a really wide range of topics, and these were sort of the big points that I pulled out from our conversations. The first is when you're working with scam victims, recognize and acknowledging the potential trauma that they have gone through, you know, especially when we're dealing with scams that are based on a love interest or based on fear. Maybe they thought their grandchild was kidnapped. Maybe they thought they were going to be arrested. Maybe they thought that all of their money was going to end up in China. You know, when you have those really strong emotional scams, that is likely to lead to some form of trauma for that particular individual. You know, in romance scams, we often find that the monetary loss is secondary to the heartbreak that people go through when one of these fraudsters has got someone in their sights. So remember and acknowledge that emotional trauma. Remember that there is no right reaction for folks to have. Some get angry, some get empowered, some will get depressed. So just making sure that you know, you're being cognizant of all of those emotions that someone might be experiencing. And then finally, remember that different cultural issues, language barriers, and other identity attributes might limit some, in, some people's interest in taking access to some resources, and they might impact someone's engagement either with law enforcement or with you. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about um, dealing with emotional recovery, I have just a couple of things, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Aaron. There are a number of support groups out there for victims of different frauds and scams. And one thing that we find most challenging, frankly, when we are dealing with victims of frauds and scams, is if someone has been continually communicating with a fraudster for a number of years, we can't replace that communication. We can't replace someone who was talking to a fraudster several times a day. So giving them another outlet to share their experiences, to build those connections, is going to be really, really important to that recovery. So AARP Fraud Watch Networks, Volunteers of America, has some um, support groups that they will help that they, for scam victims where people can share their experiences and talk about what they've gone through and talk about recovery. The Cybercrime Support Network has support groups that are unique for romance scam victims. Additionally, if someone is in a position where this is needed, you know, make sure they're considering mental health, mental health counseling and then also encouraging social connections. We know that isolation and loneliness is something that people experience, is something that can really be a driver behind when someone is willing to communicate with a fraudster. Next slide, please. All right, Erin, back to you. Thanks. So today we've really focused our conversation around resources, but we also wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about language and how we talk about fraud. The words we use to talk about schemes and fraud can be profoundly impactful, and we want to spend some time discussing the implications that words have on preventing and recovering from scams and frauds. Next slide. So how do we talk about fraud right now? Oftentimes we use ageist language. 
an ageist language is going to be language that describes an older person as a group, as dependent or frail or burdensome, and it's going to be language that diminishes an individual's aptitudes, personal agency, and the vast diversity among older people. But doing this consistently over time makes ageist thoughts and ideas normalized in our society. And the impact of this can be seen in health, social, and economic harms to older adults. And in relationships to scams and frauds, it can foster an environment in which elder financial mistreatment is more likely to occur. We also see that ageist, narr ageist narratives around financial fraud can inadvertently victim blame older adults who have experienced a financial loss. So for example, a phrase like Alex was duped or Chris was conned, assign fault to the innocent victim rather than ascribing culpability to the criminal offender. If we talk about and treat older adults as a group, as frail, dependent, and vulnerable, then we're gonna continue fostering inaccurate, inaccurate and ineffective perceptions of the older community that do not align with older adults' abilities. Using this type of language can also increase feelings of shame or embarrassment among someone who has experienced financial loss. And these feelings of shame and embarrassment mean that someone may not report financial abuse or financial loss and it will result in fewer opportunities overall for criminal justice remedies and relief. We also see a contrast in using victim-centric or survivor-specific terminology that can signal and inform an individual's identity, status, and recovery following abuse. So for example, survivor language connotates courage and healing, but using victim language that is frequently used by law enforcement um, as the impetus for investigation and prosecution. So the language used can change the outcome of the case and how people respond to the events that have happened to them. Next slide. To improve outcomes and reduce elder mistreatment, we wanna focus on reframing the narrative on aging and elder abuse. How we communicate a message is at least as important as the message itself. And language can shape identities, collective beliefs, and our actions in society. Reframing aging is a communication strategy that uses a solutions-oriented approach to age, base, age bias, highlighting the values of justice, equity, inclusion, and solidarity. We can promote positive perceptions of aging and reduce ageism by framing age bias as a shared concern that impacts all of us collectively. The reframing elder abuse communication strategy is something, I, I'm gonna provide a link, sorry, I don't have the link on this page, I just realized, but I'll, we'll, I'll um, provide the link on the next page to the communication strategy. But there are resources that you can use to change the language you're using. So one approach is going to be to reframe the constructs that are using the victim shaming language that I just mentioned. And rather than use victim shaming language, attribute the misconduct to the perpetrator. So one example of how you could do that is saying, it's not the older adult who is scammed, but rather a criminal stole money from them and wiped out their retirement savings. So this approach is going to make it more likely for someone who might be reluctant to report the fraud to see that this has been a criminal activity and they need to report the fraud to law enforcement in order to have a fraud investigation and receive the support they need. As a community, we can all work together to dispel misconceptions by recognizing and talking about older adults with capabilities and their contributions, rather than using the language that is ageist. And so with awareness and education, we can invoke a collective responsibility for systemic change and shift the public understanding of the age of the ageist language that we're using 
and reduce the use of that language in our society. On next slide, please. So if you're interested in learning more about how to change the language that you use to talk about aging, fraud, and older adults, then there are some wonderful resources that have been developed. So first, I wanted to talk about the Talking Elder Abuse Toolkit, which is a toolkit created by the Frameworks Institute, and it's designed to help advocates who work in the field to increase public understanding of why elder abuse is a matter of public concern, the causes of elder abuse, including social determinants and environmental factors that can foster the occurrence of abuse, and what solutions are available to prevent elder abuse. It also has information on how to help with the well-being of those who've experienced abuse. And as I mentioned before, there's also the Reframing Aging Initiative. And so this is where the link is to the Reframing Initiatives, Aging Initiatives website. And on this website, you can find resources that provide more information about what ageism sounds like and also suggestions for what you can do to confront ageism if you see it or experience it. Um, and they also have on this website a quick start guide that you can use to start immediately thinking about how to choose better words for how you're talking about things. Um, and then finally, in addition to the toolkit that Framebridge has, or I'm sorry, that Frameworks has um, around talking elder abuse, they also offer a class titled Reframing the Conversation on Elder Abuse. And the course provides advocates working on the issues of elder abuse with a comprehensive, comprehensive communication strategy that has been tested to improve public understanding and support for policy solutions that address and prevent elder abuse. So there are a lot of resources, and as I mentioned, this is not just um, a one-off problem, but it needs a collective systemic solution in order to shift the public understanding of how we talk about um, aging, fraud, and older adults. So I hope you'll take a look at some of these resources. And next slide. All right. So I think now we are going to. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to think. Say, I think we're going to open it up to questions. So I don't know, Jessica, if we have questions in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead and take a moment. Some. I just want to say, Erin and Jackie, some great, great resources uh, that you know that uh, the states and municipalities will be able to use uh, regarding this. So I appreciate all of that. Uh, so if you all have any questions, go ahead and throw them in the question box. We have about five minutes for questions. So I do have one, and I'm going to give this one to Jackie. It says, can the RAT do anything regarding cri uh, cryptocurrency payments? Um, so it is going to be a little bit dependent on what exchange the payment was made to. There are some exchanges, including those based here in the U.S., who are going to be more interested in working with U.S. law enforcement. So it is not a guarantee by any stretch of the imagination, but the short answer is yes, it is worth a try. So if you have someone who sent money via cryptocurrency, definitely encourage you to make that IC3 complaint. Um, it is never going to hurt. It is only potentially going to help. All right, thank you. Uh, I got another question here uh, for Erin, both you and Jackie, but Erin, I'll start with you. So you talked about a lot of great resources, toolkits that we can use to build potentially teams, MDTs. For those of us who are in the smaller states and or counties, where do you recommend we start? So taking these resources, but how do we get the communication out there? How do we bring people in? Uh, to Just where do we start with that? Yeah, so I think um, if you are thinking about how to start working together, I would really recommend looking at that CFPB Elder Fraud Prevention Network Development Guide, because I think that guide is really focused on how to bring people together in your community, and so that'll have great tips on how to start mobilizing stakeholders um, related to these topics, even if you don't have an MDT or something set up yet. All right, thank you. 
And then I have a comment here. Sometimes people don't want to admit to APS workers, and then two to three reports later, more money has been lost. These tools are very helpful for giving to victims and clients. All right. Any other questions? Well, Erin and Jackie, thank you so much again for this. Uh, Andy, I think we'll go to the next slide. I believe we have one more, uh, our closing slide. So again, uh, Jackie and Erin, thank you so much for being here to talk on this important uh, topic and make sure that everybody has access to all the tools to make us successful uh, in working with our older adult population. So we would like to thank everyone for joining today. Please remember to complete your webinar evaluation when you close out the webinar and have a wonderful day. All right, thank you.